Hello, this is Bino. Today I wanted to do a video on a piece of equipment that um, I was able to uh, search out and purchase for the city of Cerritos. It's a Caterpillar 910M. It's a mini or a compact wheel loader. It's about 100 horsepower, um, full of power. Comes with a grapple bucket or a four-in-one bucket. Um, we bought it because our old equipment was breaking down and was um, a little bit smaller. So we needed something that with more power. So this Caterpillar is a really awesome piece of equipment. What this video is going to be about is um, their heavy equipment trainer. His name's Paul. He came out and gave us an orientation on it. So I just wanted to do this video to show about this 910M and some of the great features that it has. Um, and uh, to, to use it as a reference to go back to that you can see some of the things that are important to know about it. In this uh, series of M series of Caterpillar, they have a 910M and they have a 914M and also a 918M. Now all of these are kind of almost a carbon copy of each other except for the higher the number, the more power and a little bit bigger. But anyhow, this video is just going to be on uh, trainer Paul coming over and giving us an orientation of the equipment. Um, hope you guys enjoy. So the big thing that makes this unique, it is a wheel loader, but it is tier four final. Okay, so there's some things that go with tier four final that we need to know. First is you got to put depth in it. You guys familiar with depth? Y'all know what depth does, what depth is. I get some shaking their heads this way. I got some shaking their heads that way. So it looks like we're kind of on the fence with depth. So what depth is, is basically a mixture of urea and deionized water. Urea is an agricultural fertilizer. It's a form of nitrogen and it's a derivative of livestock urine. So when you hear it referred to as goat piss, cow piss, horse piss, whatever. I'm not exactly sure what kind of piss, but okay. So it's got to happen. And what it does is it is injected into the exhaust stream. So it doesn't go into the fuel, anything like that. It goes into the exhaust stream. What it does when it gets into the exhaust stream is it takes NOx, nitrogen oxides, converts it into ammonia. Then that goes through a catalyst and is converted back into nitrogen. And then it basically comes out the stack of a hot water. Cool. And it's all about emissions because it's all about NOx reduction. So when we started out, we just had tier zero engine, got a lot of NOx and particulates and all this. And then, you know, we've been after NOx in cars since the very early 70s. And then it got into the, you know, the on highway trucks and stuff. They started really clamping down on NOx. Now they've gotten to the off road equipment. So it's all about NOx reduction. So we went from tier zero to tier one, to tier two, to tier three, to tier four interim, to now tier four. And it's all about bringing that NOx stuff down. So that's what it is. And the best, easiest, and most efficient way to get rid of NOx and diesel exhaust is... Exactly, <laughs> urea, death, whatever you want to call it, okay? So we got to put death in it. And the easiest way to do it, if you want to make it a no-brainer for yourselves, is just top the depth off when you top the fuel off. If you do that, you never have to look at the gauge. You don't have to worry about it. It's going to go more than a tank of fuel on a tank of depth. Sweet. But if you want to put it in as needed, that's fine. You can monitor the gauge and put it in as you go. Alrighty. Now, I recommend for cooler cleaning, honestly, compressed air because when you use a pressure washer and you can it's there's nothing wrong with that if you go back into a dusty environment with those cooler cores wet and it's dusty then it turns to mud and when mm. it dries instead of having a cooler core you have an adobe brick right right have fun cleaning that right right if they add the triangle for some way get through here will do not put cooler? it over here because you no. restrict airflow what is what these bolts right here? Better you can it. do it right here. It's for a license plate. Oh, right. license plate. But if you want to put slow moving, you can. Right, all right. And I have a county, neighboring county, that does that. 
on the back of their skid steers and it draws air in from the back and blows it up the top. They put these big solid placards on it and said, you know, um, you just cut off airflow. half makes your airflow. No You're going to run hot in the summer. Right. No, we Where else are we going to put it? I said, not the there. side. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere but not there. Like to put fuel in it. I just lift it up because we're talking about it. And that way we can talk about it. Is there a filter we need to be cleaning out? Oh, air filter. The air filter right there services through the top. If you stand on the fender, you can, there's a door and you flip four cam buckles, pop the lid off and pop the filter out. Oh, okay. You do want to check that on a regular basis. Check your engine oil right here every day. Okay, we checked our coolant, we checked our uh, engine oil, check your hydraulic oil. Now, you got a fuel water separator here. So it's something to look at. So you want to look at that fuel water separator, see if you got any water. Y'all know what water and the fuel is going to look like in that thing? It's okay if you know. You can say, no, we don't. No, we don't. All right. It's going to look like a bottle of Italian salad dressing. Y'all know what that looks like, right? Right. It's going to have a separation line. Water on the bottom, fuel on top simply drain the water off and close it. This machine has an electric prime system that comes on with the key. When you turn a key on, the prime system comes on. It's pretty handy. So if I were to drain a bunch of water out of there, I'd just turn a key on, maybe wait a minute, then start it. If someone were to run it out of fuel, and I know you guys wouldn't do anything silly like that, <laughs> but it happens. Shouldn't because there's like three levels of warning before it gets that low on the dash. But you know, so they run it out of fuel. You can put fuel in a tank, turn the key on, wait about four or five minutes to start it. Never crack the injector lines loose on these engines to bleed air if you run it out of fuel. The problem is, is they're high pressure common rail fuel systems, and the fuel pressure in those fuel rails is very, very high, and it can injure you severely so if it ever gets run out of fuel or you want to change your fuel filters you don't have to fill them up we don't want you to fill them up because when you pre-fill filters you just put unfiltered fuel into your fuel system put them on dry turn the key on wait about five minutes start it okay you can see the coolant from this side too if you like mm. so okay depth goes here you see the little blue cap Anything that takes depth has a blue cap. It's an isograph. Your guys' right. truck takes depth, right? That is for the gearbox for the transmission. It has a hydrostatic transmission. It doesn't have a big planetary power shift transmission or shuttle shift transmission. It's hydrostatic, so when you look at it, it's got two drive motors. The drive motors are connected to the pump. That bubble down there, is it meant to be completely uh, yeah, full? Should, completely full? Okay. Okay. Here on this one, right there. Here, here. On a regular basis. Every 10 hours of operation. So if it runs all day, every day, grease it every day. Every day. About 10 hours of operation. If it runs 10 hours a week, grease it once a week. Gotcha. Use good quality grease, Molly base, 2-5%. to 5%. Cool. And this thing will live a long, happy life. Won't we'll get all worn out and wobbly and the uh, music. You got four tires, obviously. The thing you need to know about tires, tires need to be properly inflated. It affects your stability side to side. It affects the operating characteristics. If you have too much air in the back, they tend to bounce, especially when you got a load in the front. You don't like that. And if they're underinflated and you guys run it up and down the road a lot, they get really hot. It drives up your axle temps. So, properly inflated tires. If you walk up on a lug tire, there's a rule of thumb. You guys know that? We have a rule of thumb for lug tires. And it works on these, it works on the big trucks, scrapers, backhoes, lug loaders. Lug tires? Huh? Lug tires. Lug tires. These are what are called lug tires. These are the lugs. Oh, okay. You don't want to see any more than two lugs touching the ground. Okay. 
No more than two. No more than two lugs touching the ground. So if it's kind of flat, you're going to have a lot more of them. It'll be more of a yeah. flat base. You'll exactly. see a bunch of them on the ground. Three lugs touching the ground. You better go get an air compressor. Gotcha. Also on these tires, you want to check for cut splits and blisters. Now this thing doing tree work is probably not going to get very many cut splits and blisters. I'm surprised. Yeah, like <laughs> it would out in a demolition job or when they're loading shot rock with those big loaders, they get rock cuts. Oh. You get a big old cut in the side, you're not going to get out your pocket knife and stick the blade in to see how deep it is. <laughs> you're going to let a qualified tire guy check it out. Okay. Because if the sidewalls are compromised, it happens to be down at the bottom when you're lifting a big old heavy log and the tire deflects. It can open up and it could actually pop the sidewall. You blow Explode. a tire when you got a load in the air. Not a good thing. It'll get your heart pumped. Right. What are they like 14 wide? These things, yeah, probably close to it. These things are uh these things are actually a bias ply tire. They're not a radial, they're bias ply. So the one thing about bias ply is they got very sturdy sidewalls for loading. They're really stable and they're tough. The downside to bias ply if they sit overnight on a real cold night in the morning, they got flat spots. So you'll feel them slapping a little bit till yeah. the tire gets hot and it gets round again. If you look at it, and this thing just goes into the notch and keeps the pin from walking out. That's all it does. Okay. But if it ain't there, the pins can start walking out. You definitely don't want your tilt cylinder pin walking out, then all of a sudden you got a load. And so when it starts getting worn back to the base edge, you can flip it. Take the hardware out, flip it. I usually recommend you get new hardware when you flip it. Once you wear the second side out, put a new cutting edge on it. Don't let it wear into the base edge. Okay? Hmm. Any questions about that? Warning, it's a crushing area. Keep your distance. And if you have to be in there when the machine's running or you're jacking the machine up or lifting it with the crane, you've got to put your articulation lock in. If you're not sure how to lock it, the little book there, read the OMM. It tells you. And I'm going to show you or tell you. Here it is. Right here. So it's got a little keeper, little lynch pin, if you will. It's locked. Okay? That way it's locked. It cannot come in and get you if you're in this area. There's the air going in the cab. So run it with the doors and the windows shut and you get filtered air. And the cab don't get all dirty inside. Mm, perfect. Make sense? It has air conditioning and heat. Why not? Now we know it's a ROPS because we got a certificate right here. So if you're ever out on a job and some, I don't know, guy that looks official comes up, is that a ROPS on that machine? You can say, well, yes it is, and here's my tag. Because we couldn't sell it if it didn't have a ROPS. And below that is a do not drill or weld sticker. So that means no drilling into this cab structure or welding on it. If you do, it is no longer a certified ROPS. The seat also has lumbar adjustment. Make sure you got plenty of lumbar because you want to maintain that lumbar curve. And keep your seat back adjusted up to where your back is fully supported. Don't be laying it back like this and then up here like this and then laying back like this. This is for snoozing. This ain't for operating. Because you only get so many bends out of your back in a lifetime, don't waste them up in here. Go do something fun with all those bends. So I always keep my seat up to where I'm comfortable, but if I get jarred or something, my back is fully supported. Okay? You want to play bus driver? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So this pedal, what it does is it neutralizes the transmission system and applies brake. 
This pedal is your foot control governor or throttle pedal, accelerator pedal, gas pedal, whatever kind of pedal you want to call it, but it's the one you push when you want to go. <laughs> okay? Now, when my key's on, I've got some information I get to look at. How many hours are on the machine? How many miles are on the machine? What gear I'm in and what direction I'm going? And how many RPM the engine's turning? I got some gauges to look at. I got engine temperature, death level, fuel level, and hydraulic temperature. If I want to, if I'm just doing some low key, don't really need a lot of power, I'm on flat groundwork, I can put it in eco mode. Eco mode works pretty good. You don't need all the power. Okay, I got my fog lights, in case it's foggy. I got my rotary beacon switch, if I have a beacon light on it. And I got my lights, roading and front work lights and rear work lights, okay? Don't need lights, turn them off. So it has a uh, transmission automatic shift? Or? It's a hydrostatic, so there's no gears. It just goes from zero up to its highest speed. Depends what range you have it in. Is there a higher low, like if you're loading or something? Yes, there is. Very good question. There is actually more than meets the eye. So I got a button here. Right now I'm in first gear. Now I'm in second gear. First and second. Now I can hold that down. Now I'm in high. There's no gear shift. But if you're taking it down the road, let's say you're going to in and out for lunch, you're out on a job, this is all you got, so you're going, you're on a running high. So you hold that button and it goes to high? No, this one. Oh, okay. okay. When you're loading and working, you put it in low, and then whatever gear is appropriate, one or two. Mm -hmm. So working, and if you're loading and it's really hard, you're pulling a tree out, you got one. If you don't need that much power and you're out working, you can hit two. And That's what, this button. The one on top, the round button on top of the joystick. Right. That's your gear selector in low. Yeah. Huh? It shows you one and two. And it shows you right here, see? If you look at your round button on top, it's one and two. One and and two. it tells you right here. One, two. So I pick whatever I want in low range when I'm working, but when I'm taking it down the street, I go ahead and hit this button and hold it down. Now I got H. That means I'm in high roading speed. Is it like 25 miles per hour? Eh, I don't know if it's quite 25, but she gets rolling pretty good. Hot or cold? Okay, three speed fan. It's got a 12 volt port in case you have to charge something. It's got a rear window defogger, rear window wiper, and washer. It's got the quick coupler lock switch and it's got a pilot lockout. If I lock the pilots, none of this works. I can still drive it, but this ain't moving. The pilot is that big red button on the side panel. Right here. Right there. This one is your quick coupler lock pin. So when we want to change the bucket out. This one. That one there, okay. Okay, so this is what works your grapple right here. Or your MP bucket, it opens and closes the MP bucket or four in one, whatever you guys like to call it. It's the right lever button on the joystick. It's a thumb roller. This one is your forward, neutral, reverse. So you got forward, neutral, reverse. Hear the backup alarm? This is just a turn signal and front wipers, washers. Alrighty. How about the two buttons that have underneath? Oh, we never talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> two buttons on the bottom. Okay, you got two buttons on the bottom. If you look over here, one of them is for your differential lock, the bottom one, and the upper one is for continual flow hydraulics. So I can hit it and turn it off. See, I got my light on. My front differential's locked. I can go straight, but you don't want to turn. Oh. So what I do, and I tell people to use it, there's two ways to do it. If I hold it while I'm using my dip lock and let go, it's gone. So I can either use it as a momentary by keeping my finger on the button while I'm using it, and then let go and it's gone, or I can just give it a quick click and it stays on. 
So you don't want to turn when that's on? No, because oh. what happens is this. A yeah. It's a lot of stress on your front axle because when you're turning, the outer wheel has to turn faster than the inner wheel, but if you got them locked together with a clutch in the middle, they can't yeah. do that. Okay. And it's hell on your differential and axle. Okay. That is for if, let's say, we're in the mud, whatever, and we're trying to get a load, but we got a wheel spinning in the front, you can take your foot out of the throttle and then hold the button is what I normally tell people get through it then let go of the button and then you're back to normal then you're back to normal All right so that's more for better traction to get you out better of better traction to gotcha. if you're having trouble getting the bucket full because the wheel's spinning maybe you're trying to pull that tree and you start spinning a front wheel okay, okay. you can give yourself a little extra traction that's all it does cool the last button we're going to talk about is constant flow hydraulics okay none of your tools use constant flow hydraulics you got a bucket it's momentary so it's you know you got to be able to open it and close it let's say you put a broom on it you got a broom mm. you want that thing to constantly turn and you don't want to hold your thumb here all day so i would turn it on hit the button let go and let go then my broom would stay running so the constant flow would be the left button on the underside? Top button on the underside. On the right side then? That in oh. combination with this. Okay, so that's a constant flow. Right. Gotcha. We'll never have use for that one. Top button. No, nah, unless you got a broom on it or something, you'll never use constant flow. Okay, so you can see what's behind you. We're all good with that, right? Mm -hmm. If I want to look at it like a mirror, I can flip the button. See, everything's mirrored image. Want to go back to what I was? Go back to what you were. Now, you'll notice we got C1, C2, and C3. You're going to be in C1 because you only have one camera. Some machines like scrapers, they'll have a camera at the cutting edge, they'll have a camera off the side and in the rear, and you can toggle so you can see whatever view it is you're interested in. The one on the cutting edge is cool because I don't have to turn around and look at my cutting edge. So, you'll notice... Right now, it's not eco mode. Sometimes that's all you need, guys. You're not climbing hills. You're not loading out of a hard face. And these things do have a lot of power. But if you really need it, there you go. With the fuel that's on there, eco mode? Yep. Burns a lot less fuel in eco mode. And honestly, for what you're doing, eco mode will work just fine. Cool. Okay, so this is how you work your grapple, see? And they work independently of each other if you're not familiar with them. Okay? Be nice, guys. If I want to take the bucket off, I simply go here, push the red tab, push the button down. And it releases it. I can feel it release. Okay. All I got to do is roll out of my bucket. I don't want to do too much because I got hoses on. Yeah, the hoses are But you see, connected. you got the idea? Right. Then I just come back, hook it, roll it back. Then I push down. And I feel it. You hear it go over relief? You can hear it hiss. Yes. You can hear it hiss, wait till it hisses at you, and then always do that once to make sure that bucket is locked on. Okay, cool. Okay? So it'll be off pressure once you release it, then you pull the, the pins, or you do the pins, uh, the hoses first, right? Do the hoses first. Okay. Okay, now guys, sometimes those hoses have pressure in them, and they can be a real booger. Turn your key on, but don't start the engine. You can take this now, hear it clunking. Did you hear that thing clunk and groan a little bit? I just let all the pressure off the hoses. Mm. But you have to have the key on, the engine off, and then roll this a couple times. You can even play with this, see how it all settled, and this if you'd like. But your key's got to be on, engine not running to do it. Now you can pop your lines off, there won't be any pressure in them. Alrighty.
See, and you can tell. See how this thing's kind of rattly? I know there's no pressure in it. Okay, so you can... So, another thing that'll catch you, too. See that little notch? Yeah. There's a little ball. What I do is I just feel for it. Bam. Okay. And when I want to put it on... See with no pressure? It's okay. a one-hand operation. Okay. If there's pressure, it's like a six-hand operation. Right, right. And three guys. Wow. So it's that, that one And there. then you can turn this if you want, and that locks safety it. locks it. You don't have to, but you can. Okay. I should probably tell you, yes, you must. All right. So it's this one, and then it would be this one. Yep. The only two. And those and little ones sure... on the bottom, we don't worry about. Yeah, those are your quick coupler lines. Now, I guess Jeff told you guys to add these these are cool once you get it disconnected unhook your lines you can simply drop them through or just bend them and kind of get them out make sure your lines are in here so they're secured on the side so they're not, not flopping around. around okay okay also another piece of advice and you can take it or leave it if you're not using your tools it's parked out in the yard snap your two lines together okay for a couple of reasons for one, it protects the quick couplers. That's a good reason, right? Mm -hmm. Two, if these things are sitting out there in the sun, the hot sun, and these hoses get hot, yeah. it can expand that oil just enough to give you pressure in these lines. And man, they are a brute thing because you got pressure in the line. They're a lot harder than that one hand operation I just did. So always connect your lines together. And on the empty bucket, what I do on those, once I hook it on the machine, if my lines are hooked together, I roll it back just a little bit to make sure that the bucket is up against the stop, so there's no pressure, then I pop my lines apart, and there's no pressure. Okay? Oh, cool. And that's all I got. Awesome. Thank you. Can't clap. <laughs> So that was our new 910M Caterpillar. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Like, comment, and subscribe. Take care.